Hi, I'm Dr. Kim Logan Nolan. And I'm Arthur Nolan. And welcome to Making It Work. When we talk about the different aspects of making it work, we want to bring to you quality programs that's going to impact and help your families. But we're dealing with some serious issues in our communities, in our school system. I live in the Detroit, Michigan area, where Detroit Public Schools was once a very, very inspiring place to be educated in. But that has changed, as I'm sure has changed in, across the country. Well, today I have a special guest and a friend, Fedra Nelson, who is a school teacher. And she's here to talk about the difference of public school teaching, working in alternative schools, and the entire impact of education today. Welcome, Fedra, to the program. Thank you. Well, where do we begin with this topic when we talk about our crowning jewels, our children, and the educational system? Tell us about where you work and why alternative school and educational teaching. I teach at Southfield Regional Academic Campus. Um, that is Southfield Public Schools Alternative High School. Um, it's a feeder school for um, Southfield Lathrop High School and okay. Southfield High School. Okay. Um, and the school is there to give students who are short of having the credits that they need to graduate on time. Okay. So that school is there to give them the, uh, the opportunity to still be able to graduate on time. Our, our program is designed specifically for students who are short of those credits. Mm. So, so it really is a Southfield Public School? Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Um, how long have you been in that type of teaching environment? Well, I've been at What's known as SRAC, Southfield Regional Academic Campus, is known as SRAC. It was once known as Arthur Ashe. Okay. Um, I've been there. This is my second year there right. at that school. Okay. But in terms of a school that primarily has um, that student population, I, pretty much since I've been teaching. And how know, long has that been? Twenty-three years. You've been in the education for twenty-three years. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. What's going on now in the educational system? And what do you see? Uh, wow. The, you know, I, I was a student mm -hmm. um, of Detroit Public Schools, and then I became a teacher in Detroit Public Schools. And since I became a teacher in the early 90s up to now, I've seen a lot of changes that have taken place. Um, the value system of our students has changed tremendously where when I was in school, um, if you came to school and you weren't prepared with your supplies or with your homework, it was an issue mm -hmm. and, and nobody really wanted to be associated with you. Like if you came in and you didn't have your pen, and people would kind of scoot away. Because <laughs> mm -hmm, you were unprepared. Right. But now it's it's so opposite where they they just don't come prepared and they don't expect you to expect them to come prepared. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different value system but that they have. How do you, oh. how do you well what do you believe got it to the point that it is now? What were the contributing factors? Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, a wide range of factors, um, and I think the factors are really based on what's going on with our society, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of the students that I deal with, the, the connection and the way that they relate to each other and the way that they relate maybe to their parents, um, the way that they see authority, all mm -hmm. of that is different mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And 
if I, if I were to probably put my finger on one particular aspect, it would probably, probably be their morals are different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over and above all. Mm -hmm. Because I think with, you know, where their morals are and how they relate to each other. Yes. Mm -hmm where their moral, morals are and how they relate to their parents mm -hmm. and how they relate to authority. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's probably like the basic foundation as to what I think has changed the most. I remember when um, in the school system uh, there were consequences for some of the things that you mm -hmm. spoke about earlier mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now there are no consequences. And it, to me it really has um, put our school system at risk because they don't feel that there are repercussions for not coming to school prepared and mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Well, now, in terms of consequences, I think the way that uh, the consequences or the, the types of consequences that that maybe you or I would, would you know, be subject to mm -hmm. were were different somewhat, mm -hmm. but there are still consequences. Because mm -hmm. I remember being in in school, in elementary school, and being paddled, mm -hmm. and so yes. that's no longer an option mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not even sure if that would even be a viable option, mm -hmm. because a lot of my students you know, they're numb to that whole concept mm -hmm. because of what they experienced at home. Mm -hmm. So paddling wouldn't even work with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But there are consequences. Um, constantly there are consequences for students. It's just, I think it's the relationship that they develop with who's issuing those consequences mm -hmm. <laughs> as to whether mm -hmm. or not those consequences are even going to have an effect. Mm -hmm. And following through. You say you're going to take my um, value or take something that I value and you say, well, I'll do it next time. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes like mm -hmm. they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned to me that you do not have a monitoring system for weapons in your school. Correct. And do you all check the book bags for weapons? The students, we don't check the book bags for weapons, but the students are not allowed to bring them into the classroom. Is that right? So book they bags. have to, no book bags no book, in the no. classroom. Mm -hmm. No. So they have to come in with their notebooks and pens, which they don't, and that's it. If they don't have that, so most of your students come in empty handed. That's yes. how it is. <laughs> yes, for the most part. So they go from. But they should at least have like a book, a, a, notebook, a notebook, or or whatever the supplies are that are required for that class. Okay. You know. And if they don't. And if they don't, then um, typically I'll have some kind of, you know, plan B where I may have a pen to exchange for mm -hmm. like something of value, mm -hmm. you know, their ID or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but even then, still, the things that they may exchange for, you know, a pen, mm -hmm. um, that's not really valuable to them. So they end up taking my pen anyway. Mm -hmm. And I end up with a, <laughs> a drawer full of stuff I can't even use. <laughs> I can't pawn. I can't and give do it away. Anything with it. Right. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> let, oh, go ahead. I was going to say the, okay, you want to follow up? Because I want to talk about the risks. What are some of the risks that you are dealing with now? in school every day when you walk into that building? What are the risks? Well, I think um, this would probably apply to any any institution, but particularly um, a school like the one where I teach. You, we're dealing with a wide range of variables as to why those kids are there. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are emotional. Mm -hmm. um, some of them just have, you know, a, a certain mindset where they're not really interested in being there. There's just so much going on. And so really at, at any time, at any given moment, we may be dealing with, uh, you know, an emotional situation that a student is dealing with where they're bringing it mm -hmm. in from outside. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that puts us, I think, all on notice where we always have to be aware that there there are limits to which we can deal with this child, you know, in regards to the issues they may 
be dealing with as it affects the classroom, as it affects everybody in that classroom or everybody in that building. Mm -hmm. We have to we have to kind of know <laughs> what the limits mm -hmm. are. So we we do have security mm -hmm. and we do have a police liaison that you know mm -hmm. stays in the building, yeah. um, and and they do have the power to actually take you know, someone into custody if they're posing a threat. Mm -hmm. All these children, I'm sorry, are, uh, they live, they're residents of the Southfield area? Correct. In Southfield, Michigan? Correct. I see. Well, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was basically, now that you recognize that security is needed to some extent. To a, yeah, to a great know. extent. <laughs> so, what a, What's the, the future outlook as far as dealing with how school deals with security and with students coming in with, as Kim in, indicated earlier, with book bags? And mm -hmm. what, what did you meet after, especially after the incident in Connecticut? You know, did they talk to all the teachers? Did they? Absolutely. We, we, we kind of, we, we went over what we already have in place. Mm. And we went over how, if we reinforce what we already do, mm -hmm. it should, to some degree, um, ensure that we have some safety. Some things may be out of our control. Mm. Um, after the situation in Connecticut, that's when we got the police liaison mm. um, in our building. And so, okay. You know, we have certain protocol in order, like just simply keeping the doors closed, you know, mm -hmm. unlocked at all times, like our classrooms. Rooms are locked. Your yeah. classroom are like, so if anybody comes to your door, you have to open it yourself. Right. I see. Absolutely. The students aren't allowed to open the door. Um, and then even with that, we have, we have one door that's for anybody to enter mm -hmm. and exit mm -hmm. during the day. Okay. And then after school, there's certain doors that the students exit. So there are certain things that are in place, and then we have security mm -hmm. that monitors the halls. Tell me, we have a, we have like a security system, you know, a camera system. So oh, okay. pretty See much that. that you know the whole school can be seen at any time, mm -hmm. at least in the hallways. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think about, and I'm, I've talked to many people uh, in regards to this, is that they felt that it was really significant that uh, the the opportunity to pray in school mm -hmm. was taken away. Mm -hmm. um, what's your thoughts on that? You know, do you feel that it, it was is something that's vital or important? Or? It's absolutely vital. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, I would say the whole piece of the, the moral fiber mm -hmm. and foundation for our students, you know, is the one thing I think is probably the major factor in the breakdown that we've seen mm -hmm. in the value system of our students. Um, so I think it's essential and I think it's unfortunate that, um, that it's even really an issue mm -hmm. in the classroom because, you know, even like I teach literature so, but I teach, I teach 11th grade mm -hmm. and I teach American literature. Mm -hmm. Well, when we cover the unit mm -hmm. that talks about the Puritans mm -hmm. and we, we read literature that was relevant to the Puritans mm -hmm. and it makes reference to God mm -hmm. <laughs> and Christianity, you know, sometimes my students are like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> Even supposed to, I'm like it's the literature. Is it okay? Right, right. <laughs> you know, they're, they they're challenge you. On they that? do. They do. Uh -huh. They do. But we have a prayer group at our school. That was my next question. And yeah. they pray daily. We pray over our school daily. And I think that that prayer group has been really the the um, saving grace. Really, really to our school. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have a um, Christian club mm -hmm. at our school mm -hmm. that is sponsored by um, one of our teachers there. Mm -hmm. And so every day during lunch, the students come with her mm -hmm. and they discuss um, different issues as it relates to their spiritual development. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's really, and they get counseling from her. It's, it's a mm -hmm. really good thing. And then to see 
this particular group of students, you know, come faithfully to her, mm -hmm. you know, and get knowledge and they get food so in more than one way because she feeds them lunch on Friday. Oh, <laughs> but, okay. I think I but, will enjoy it. <laughs> so if they have a Christian club, mm -hmm. do they have other different organizations in the school? Yeah. No, that that would be the only one as it involves mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. The other, the prayer group involves staff. Mm -hmm. And so any any staff member that wants to come, and it's always after school, any staff member that wants to come and join, and yeah. They can be a part of it. Yeah. Exactly. When the shooting took place in Connecticut, where were you? And you have a young child mm -hmm. in elementary school. Mm -hmm. Where were you and what impact did that have on your life and her life? Um, when When I heard the news of the shooting, I was actually on a field trip with our school's performing arts mm -hmm. company and we were on our way back and we had just done a performance for uh, Christmas mm -hmm. for um, a school in Ann Arbor, an elementary school right. in Ann Arbor. So it kind of really kind of took us, you know, it took us totally off our, we were on this whole nother vibe and we were so impressed with the students and how well behaved they were. Mm -hmm. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the perfect audience, they were just perfect, perfect. these little kids. All right. And then I guess one of the, the teachers got a tweet mm -hmm. about the, the kids being killed in Connecticut mm -hmm. and it just changed the whole vibe mm -hmm. on the bus, wow. the whole vibe on the bus. Mm -hmm. Because I think as teachers, we could relate. Um, and as parents, we could relate. And then the other students on the bus, I mean, you know, they have siblings, mm -hmm. they're students, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they right. could relate. Mm -hmm. And it was, it just kind of took us, you know, it took us off our, our thing for a minute. But, so it was um, announced on the bus. Yeah. Well, it was because somebody got a, a a tweet about oh, it, mm -hmm. one of the teachers, and then they looked it up on YouTube, mm -hmm. or not YouTube, but the internet. Right. And, there and then after that, everybody wanted mm -hmm. to know more. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then mm -hmm. later that day, I went to pick up my daughter mm -hmm. from school, and um, I, I mentioned it to her, but she didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She didn't. She didn't get it initially. Mm -hmm. She didn't, because mm -hmm. she was saying, "What that happened at my school?" I'm like, "No, mm -hmm. if it happened at your school, you would know." So she really didn't understand. Right. Mm -hmm. But the subsequent days, the follow, she did mm -hmm. get it. She did understand, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, it kind of inspired her to to write a song that she she had in her head. She had started this song in her head, but it, it had to do with how she feels safe going mm -hmm. to school every day. Mm -hmm. So her music is a place where she goes to create and she writes her music to make and help her to feel better. It's her safe haven. Now, in our society today, you know, you take her to school, you hope to be able to pick her up, and you go to your school hoping to even get out of there safely. And, and then the routine begins over and over again. But when you think about your own daughter and what took place in Connecticut. I mean, no one could even fathom what those parents went through. And, and coming from a, a perspective of a teacher who guarded all those other ch children, you know, well, what did you think about that woman who saved those other children? I, I could relate to her because I've, I've been in situations where my students life was in danger and there was not any time to think about it. it, it you right. just do what you have to do at that time. And I could understand how she, she did what she did. Um, because once those kids cross the threshold, they're more than students. Right. I mean, they're not just, you know, students. They're right. not in a box. Right. They're your kids. Right. They're yours. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't change even once they cross back over that threshold That's and they're right. gone and they move on. When they come back to visit you, they're still yours. That's right. You know, so it, as a teacher, their safety, physical, mental, mm -hmm. it's all it, it's all your responsibility. And if you take it seriously, 
then certain things you don't think, well, that's just a student. I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm let, you know, I'm hide under this. That it you just can't. doesn't go that way. You, you know, not I, if you take your your, your it, responsibility seriously. You got these yeah. lives, and even even if you just think of it in terms of, okay, I'm teaching, and it's my responsibility just to teach them. That is such a serious charge and undertaking. If you take it seriously, there are certain things that aren't even questionable as to whether or not you're going to do something about it to make sure that that happens. And so their physical and mental safety is very important. And she, you know, I can relate to not even thinking about it, just, just do what you got to do at that time. And you're dealing with a, a lot of the, the, I guess, negativity that exists in the classroom, especially when you're talking about students that have, uh, that are going to alternative school, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, is it, uh, Sometimes that you may have yourself placed in a situation that could be dangerous to some extent. I think anytime you're dealing with people mm -hmm. who have issues mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily know about, I mean, you, you're always in a vulnerable position to some de degree or another. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being aware of that, it helps to know as much as you can about each individual. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're serious about trying to be successful in that classroom, you're going to get to know mm -hmm. them personally and, mm -hmm. and you're going to address them from where they are. Mm -hmm. And so it actually can lessen any threat of any vulnerability you may have by not knowing. Mm -hmm. So if you know their issues or you know where they're coming from or you know them personally, you know when and when not to and how far to go or what you, you just kind of have a feel for what to do oh, okay. with, with them. No, um, I teach in a community college also. I had an experience about four semesters ago. I had a student who did not like his, um, it hadn't even gotten to the midterm yet but he did not like the grading system I used. So he began to threaten me, began to say that um, I'm gonna make sure you don't see tomorrow. It was very, very difficult, but I had to stand my ground, my <laughs> standards of teaching. Mm -hmm. And they had to have a security guard by my door and to escort me to and from my car. And this young man eventually contacted me um, and we had a meeting and he said, truly really apologized for his anger and his rage, but he never had a teacher to make him work and did not tolerate just any type of work. Mm -hmm. And I made it very clear that I will fail you. Mm -hmm. You have to do this. And I gave you, uh, you only get two opportunities to correct your assignments. And you're in college now. Mm -hmm. And if I ask for something specifically, that's <laughs> what I want. And I told my husband and I said, I just, I will not allow someone to bully me mm -hmm. or make me feel that I'm inadequate or you're going to threaten my life so that you can control my classroom. And I see it happen all the time where these students control the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I feel that that teacher should not be in that classroom. Mm -hmm. But but isn't it a particular protocol that's established when you're in those situations with students? I mean, yes, because the, the thing that that protects us is our syllabus. Mm -hmm. If it's in the syllabus, then the college stands behind whatever is in the syllabus because mm -hmm. we have to send that syllabus over you know, uh, weeks before classes begin. And they go through it, they go through the assignments. If anything needs to be corrected, you get it back. So you're only allowed one unexcused absent in my class. Mm -hmm. The assignments are there, the dates that they're due, what I expect. And so if they go to the dean and say, well, this wasn't, and the dean pulls up my syllabus, mm -hmm. and they say it's right there. Mm -hmm. But but not yes. only with the sy syllabus. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking about if I have an irate student that is uh, causing difficulties in the classroom, then 
I mean, there's a protocol that's oh, yeah. that's that's established that you have to follow. Is that correct? Not, especially in a public school. We, we call paper. security mm -hmm. yes. and, we, and we write it up. Right. That's we, what we call we okay, security so and we write it up. You have to write it up. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, yeah. A complaint. We, we, Ask them to leave, mm -hmm. and we write it up. Right. And that's how that goes. Because I had a student who would not leave. And a matter of fact, this particular security guard goes to one of my sister churches, and he was coming by to make the rounds. They make these rounds. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to argue with you. Well, you can't make me get out. I said, but he can. Mm -hmm. And I said, <laughs> and he came in, and I said, you must escort this student. And it was a female student. And I said, wow. does anybody else want to leave? Because you will not control my classroom. Wow. Yes. Wow. Well, you know, now that's something else that I've seen um, change in the, you know, since I've been teaching is students will try to run a cool. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's new to me. I think I've probably started noticing that maybe in the last 10 years mm. where it's like, well, we, if we all don't do our work, then you have to change and give us another opportunity to do it. Or, you know, they, it's like they, you know, and I'm like, well, you all don't do your work, then you all <laughs> get it up together. Right. You know, and I've seen that happen where like an entire class would fail, but they would do it collectively mm -hmm. to try to force the teacher's hand. I've seen that happen. As a matter of fact, my son and I had a conversation about this the other day. And he told me that literally the students talk about it mm -hmm. and they say, OK, this mm -hmm. is the plan. And everybody, you know, gets on board. And if somebody's not on board, that person actually gets ousted. We have about a minute and 14 seconds. What can you suggest mm -hmm. or what tools to help our parents and family life today and how to help them make it work? What do we need to do, Fedra, as parents? talk to your your child as much as possible but openly like allow them to actually express what they're thinking and how they're feeling because even though it may not be what we know is the best way for them to mm -hmm. think and feel but once we know what's on their mind it actually gives us an avenue in which we can help to give them the information that they need. Yes. Be, be, be communicate in a respectful way. Exactly. Yes. yes. A kind exactly. and loving way. Yeah. That's what that's actually what I do with my students. Mm. Yes. You know, and my children. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and it it helps to build that relationship where there's a certain amount of respect mm -hmm. and and trust. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. and once and and once they have that trust and know that you really you know, have their best interest at heart, they'll, they'll meet the challenge. Well, that's the key, the challenge. Mm. And we all as parents have a challenge. Well, I want to thank Fedra Nelson for coming. I'm Dr. Kim Logan Nolan. I'm Arthur Nolan. And thank you for joining us on Making It Work. God bless. God bless.